All right, welcome everyone. Episode number 34 of the Wide Lens Podcast. I'm joined here with my co-host John Sim and we're going to cover the hottest and latest topics in financial markets. And we're recording this on the 24th of February at 9.52 a.m. And we have headphones. So I'm pretty pumped awesome. up about that. And yeah, we are the men in, men in black this morning. Um, right. I got my green Celtics cap on and I got my green juice. So, so it's all happening. Um, I'll kick up with um, what I've now self titled Rob's Market Rap. Um, I tried to do like rap with an R, but uh, it kind of doesn't work. But let's, <laughs> let's, start with, um, let's start with the uh, last five days uh, in the market. Um, I'll just bring this chart up now and having a quick look at the major global indices. So here I've got the Australian stock market in orange down 1.5% for the, for the week. Um, the S&P 500 in purple down a bit over 2% for the week. The NASDAQ down about 3% for the week. The emerging markets down about 1.32% for the week. And Europe continuing to uh, head in the opposite direction to the rest of the world. It's flat for the week, which um, I think there's quite a bit of money flowing into Europe now after what we've been seeing over the course of the last quarter um so i think that that momentum trade will probably still run for a little while um second chart here uh real quick what i then did was just have a look at the the um the 12 month return i might just sort of plug push these numbers out real quick um the australian stock market down one and a half percent for for the last 12 months s p 500 down one and a quarter nasdaq down about nine europe down about sorry emerging markets down 12 and Europe up a bit over two and a half percent for the last twelve months, and you can see how much of a um, turnaround we've seen since September October, um, especially in the European stock market. That blue line over there has gone from negative eighteen percent right up to plus two point six seven. So That's it's a pretty really ripped up, eh? It's a pretty pretty hard run. Um, the Australian market probably didn't fall as much as the European market did, but you know Australian markets um, still uh, still going strong. Although with um, Rio's and BHP's reports over the last couple of days, the commodity prices coming down and whatnot, uh, I think Rio cut their cut the dividend as well. Um, I don't know with um, commodity commodity companies and commodity stocks, it's just such a, it's just a big thing. It's completely out of your control, right? It's That's right. Um, so. Um, Commodity investors in for a bit of a ride, and so is the Aussie stock market, given they make up such a big portion of, of the index. I want to bring up this um, third one as well. This is from SQM. Uh, this is week ending 21st of February, so a few days from the 24th. But I, I thought this is really interesting with everything that's going on in the market um, at the moment. I went to a Thursday night auction, yes, last night, um, just uh, – was going to go bid on behalf of someone, but it just completely just got blown out of the water. But having a look at the probably most interestingly for me, if you look at the month on month change for Sydney, if you look at let's just look at houses for example, the top line item down one point five percent. Not going to go through all the cities, but probably Sydney and Melbourne major cities. Melbourne down zero point eight. Have a look at the twelve month change though. Sydney is down three point nine. It's down peak to trough about 14, 13, 14% from the numbers you were mentioning yesterday. Yeah. But Melbourne's up. Melbourne's up 1.6%. So anecdotally, I spoke to a townhouse developer yesterday and he had a, a number of townhouses that he was worried about selling and, and whether they would be able to sell them. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that was a few weeks prior to the... To, to him listing with the agents. And he came back yesterday and said, hey, look, they're all sold. I said, oh, did you get the price you want? He said, I got more than the price I wanted. So, what, you know, he sold through channel channel agents. Um, I said, so what, what was the demographics of those buyers? He said, look, the Chinese money's back. You know, people... Oh, right. China. Yeah. So uh, a lot of these new houses, he sold, sold through channels um, and, and he built in, you know, some extra fat into the price thinking they'd come back and negotiate and you know, they just wanted to, to purchase. So, you know. Did, did he lower his expectations from before? No, he, he, he had a set 
return that he wanted to make on those townhouses. Um, and so long as he made that, he was he was going to be happy. Um, and, yeah, he was pleasantly surprised. Developers are pretty, um, uh, for the most part, I think, pretty pretty structured, whereby it's less greed, where more so I think the numbers need to stack up. Once the numbers stack up, we're happy to run with it and, and, and sell and move on. Whereas... You know, your mum and dad selling the house and get emotionally involved, clicking, clinging on to numbers that may be completely um, irrational or, or just out of, completely out of the ballpark. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, yeah. on yesterday's auction, the, the, the range was 920 to 990. Um, the opening bid was like 990. It was in, in Coburg. The, the, um, the opening bid was 9, 920. It went to 930 pretty quickly. And the guy's like, we're far away from the reserve. And I'm like, why would why why are you quoting, man? If you knew so quickly yeah. how far away we are from the reserve, yeah. and anyway, I understand the rationale there. Um, yeah, and the thing got to um, a million one oh five oh. Hamill's going to go down at one oh five oh. Some other guy just jumped in, went for one point one, went for fifteen minutes. So wow. And he and he slammed that down pretty quickly. He's like, just yeah. I mean, there's an interesting dynamic there as well because there's less stock being listed on the market. Yeah. Right? So, you know, people's personal circumstances don't change because there's less stock. They still need, you know, for whatever reason to to buy mm. uh, or to move into a sure. upgrade or move into a new place. Yeah. You know, or downgrade. Or downgrade. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Um, I've got one more chart here, which I'll uh, bring up now. This is from Bespoke. Key ETF total return since... Um, the 19th of February 2020, which is the pre-COVID high. Sounds like a bit of a lifetime ago. But have a look at the US ETF. Just let me focus on the top quadrant. Um, the SPY, the S&P 500, up 24.4%. The Dow, up 20 NASDAQ, 27 Interestingly, the mid and small caps, you know, up 28 30%, which is you're still up that much even from the previous Amazing. high. Um, and on the right-hand side... Australia's up 15.49%. Brazil just an absolute roller coaster during that mm. time. EM's just been absolutely clobbered. Um, I- interestingly, India and Mexico, I mean, talk about EM, but in- India and Mexico up up 30 uh, odd percent um, as well. So a lot, a, a lot has happened since there, but also at the same time, if you sort of look point to point, not much has happened since there. Yeah. Um, so that's a quick. Quick wrap for, for me, and actually I've just noticed you've thrown a chart in there. Do you I wanna, have. Do you wanna I have. I saw this this morning, so on, on Twitter actually. So this is a chart from Sentiment Trader showing, you know, a comparison between, you know, 20-day moving averages of confidence and where the SPX is. Uh, if you look at the chart, you'll see that we're going into a, a period of, Retail turning excessively optimistic. And, you know, there's a highlighted box showing that optimism can stay extended in bull markets. But, you know, we, if we're in a bear market, that can often signify a bear market rally top. So I thought that was uh, interesting. So what, what is this saying? Is it, it that that green line has crossed that horizontal... Excessive optimism. Red line, the dotted line, line. And the other two times that it's done that, in the far left hand, back in September of they, 20- yeah, that was a bull market, yeah, and showing that during a bull market, when you've got um, excessive optimism, it just keeps running mm. in terms of the SPX. But during a bear market, when when you get to these uh, periods of uh, retail optimism, uh, oh, I see, topping, which is the vertical dotted which lines, which is the vertical dotted gotcha. lines, uh, it can indicate. Uh, bear market rally top. How do you how do you see this? Do you see this is bullish or bearish? Uh, you you know me. I'm 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 a, I'm a little bit of a, a bear at the moment, so I, I you know I feel there's there's a bit more to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, my my reading of this is is that that green line has only ever crossed that red. Li- well, if I'm going back two or three years, sure, twice. Sure. And every other time it did, we're in extended bull market. Um, that's 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 also a fair assessment. That's my, my key takeaway uh, of that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to hand over to you to the first topic. What do you got? Yeah, today we're talking about food, food security. There's a couple of interesting articles come out this week, a um, couple of headlines um, here. Uh, so ASDA, which is uh, UK's third largest grocer, 
they're rationing the sale of uh, fruit and vegetable after widespread Did you say the shortage. US largest? Oh, UK, sorry. UK. UK's largest, a uh, third oh. largest grocer. Oh, yeah. Uh, and India guards wheat crop after extreme heat scorched fields last year. So they're going to some periods of uh, potential drops in yield uh, in, in wheat crop. Um, and they're also one of the largest producers of wheat globally. So, you know, what's 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 the state of play at the moment? They've, they've had a pretty bad harvest in southern Spain and northern Africa, leading to big gaps. Is it a global thing? Uh, it's, it's affecting Europe a lot more at the moment, uh, just given uh, the seasonal change in, 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 in producing of those goods in greenhouses. So, you know, your, your, your typical salad stuff, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, you know, they're grown in glass houses in Spain, but because of colder weather, they haven't been, a- been able to mature as quickly. Uh, and right. therefore, um, there's, there's going to be a big shortage. So salad ingredients are expected to fall to the lowest level since re- records began in 1985, according to the National Farmers Union. In yeah, the right. UK. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty, Is this pretty climate big shortage. Change? Yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I think there's a big element of climate change that has to do with food security and... There's, it's going to be a big focus, I think, going forward uh, in terms of um, the impacts of climate change and um, heat and weather patterns and, and that effect on food security for, for a lot of nations globally, including Australia, I think. Are you growing your own crops at home? I'm con- contemplating it. <laughs> Hyd- hydroponics. Have you heard of those systems where, yeah. you know, you, you grow the fish and, and the nitrogen grows the vegetables at the top. I yeah. think that's a, it's a pretty smart way to, to get, get some good produce and healthy produce into. Um, my cousins and I had this crazy idea like a years ago, we we're just going to go off grid. We we're just going to buy this massive fuck off property in the bush somewhere, <laughs> just go completely off grid, grow our own vegetables, have like little tiny huts for everyone's family yeah. and just live completely off grid. <laughs> Funnily enough. Um, they have one of those in, uh, in Northern Europe that's somewhere, don't they? Oh, it's I don't a, know. A community that isn't oh, I'm governed sure. by uh, local governments. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they I'm sure we're not the only ones thinking you about go it. Go back to bartering. Bartering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got nothing to offer, man. <laughs> um, so why is this uh, why is this a big issue? You know, I think domestic supplies are being hit by a number of factors, labor shortage being one. Higher. We're talking domestic in Australia. Globally. Globally, right. Yeah, uh, but, but in Europe now, specifically focused on this article, um, you know, they're talking big labour shortages, uh, higher costs due to, due to labour as well, and, and energy, obviously due to gas pipelines being blown up in, you know, from, from Russia and into Europe, uh, and, and the cost of uh, fertiliser, which I, I actually did a bit of research on this, thinking, oh, so how much, how much of an impact does fertilizer have? And, and, you know, bring up another article, Russia and China have the biggest stranglehold on uh, the world's food security just by virtue of them being uh, one of the biggest producers of uh, fertilizer globally. So, you know, there's, it's, do you know how much they make? So uh, Canada is the world's biggest potash producer. Right. And Russia and Belarus are number two and three respectively. Yeah, right. So that's a it's a pretty big strategic commodity for a lot of nations that, that grow food and, and the soil uh, is used to being supplied with fertilizer. So, you know, it just naturally now um, needs that fertilizer to uh, produce crop. Um, so in the US, you're, they're actually seeing, similar to the $50 billion CHIPS Act where they... Um, wanted to promote U.S. semiconductor production because they, they felt mm-hmm. that, you know, they didn't have security in, in semiconductor production. They're doing that now with fertilizer. So there's another $500 million grant uh, to make American-made fertilizer production because that's, uh, you know, a big issue for food security. Mm. So, look, it, I mean, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different factors here that, that play a role in food security, um, and, you know, the Ukraine being one of them with, you know, they, they produce 80 million metric tonnes of, of grain and wheat and corn and barley a year, and that, that's now not been exported as well. So the, 
the end of the day, what happens is food security is an issue. Food costs go up and that hits everyone's bottom bottom line and hits their hip pocket a, a lot harder. With this whole Russia thing, um, I saw a chart the other day that showed the rel- European reliance on Russian natural gas or energy has gone from about 40% down to under 10% now and the dramatic decline. And so Europe is um, importing LNG they're mm. from the US. From the US, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how much they're now relying on the US, but it, it it's almost like now the US has um, sort of the, you know, stranglehold the balls, on. Yeah, that's like. right, 100%. Um, and you- did you hear about, there was an article uh, from a well-known journalist who did a huge investigation into it, and they're saying US had some, um, I guess, uh, hand in in actually blowing up that pipeline. Yeah, right. So that that's an interesting one. Maybe, yeah. You know, I, I don't think it was actually commissioned by the CIA, but they had some involvement in the blowing up of the, the gas pipeline. So, you know, I'm not a of, uh, conspiracy theories around, but this guy is a, you know, award-winning um, journalist who is well-renowned for, you know, investigation and, and, and really doing his due diligence on the facts. Um and yeah, he's 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 come up with this um, article. Actually, I what do you think the direction of food is now? Like you, you you go through all of this, and you know the interesting thing that headline, which was um, Russia and China have a stranglehold on the world food security. Like that's a really fascinating topic that I don't think gets talked about much at all. Like where do you think food's going now? Like what what is what is food? What do we as humans consume when we go to the grocery store now? Like. Do we know where the food comes from? Do we know what it is? Do we know how it's grown? I, I highly doubt that most of the population are looking at the back of labels and seeing how much is locally produced, uh, especially for the packaged goods, right? Um, maybe for the for the the I know when we go to the, the supermarket these days, you know, we're always looking at the label to see, oh, is it produced in Vietnam or Australia for uh, you know local local fruit, for example, mm. right? Um, that's an interesting one. Do you do do you look at the labels and and look where you know most of your food comes from? Um, I, I'd like to say yes, but probably not. Like, like when we go to the market for fresh fruit and veggies, like who the fuck knows where that comes from, man? Mm. Like it's just there at you know the grocer, um, and you just buy it. Like the grapes are there, the apples are there. Yeah, I've got no idea where it comes yeah. from. Um, all uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't. The bigger corporations are getting better at at disclosing where things are done, you know, made from whatever 52% local ingredients. Yeah, and that's a that's a proactive thing. You don't have to disclose no. any of that stuff. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's more of a proactive thing to put that, discl- dis- that disclosure and disclaimer on, on packaging. Um, but look, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I remember when back in the uh, – emerging markets boom back in 05 and 06 if you remember there was um food fuel and i don't know whatever the other uh f was as part of this global um shift as emerging markets were were moving from you know farms and villages into the city and the amount of consumption they were going to go through and then food was going to be a massive issue back then i don't don't know what i don't know what happened but it i mean maybe i was just oblivious i I think i think the all these articles are pointing to there's a certain fragility in the food supply chain. Uh, you know, a lot of nations relying on other nations for key components to uh, produce. Is that why the U.S. Products. is just trying to just in in house everything and yeah. not rely on anyone? Oh well, I, th- I think we're moving. You know, we, we were we were going from a, a a period of mass globalization, and then suddenly everyone's now uh, bringing that back in house, right? Why? Because of the risk security that, and the risk that that poses. You know, this you, you become too reliant on on another country uh, for for a certain for a certain good supply. And do you think Australia will be will sort of uh, follow suit, whereby you know we have manufacturing here, food, more food production? I mean, we I don't know how much food we produce, but I'm I'm like fresh fruits and yeah. vegetables. I presume we produce a shitload of. It's them. obviously a balance between uh, cost the economic cost of producing something onshore versus offshore and whether it's sustainable in terms of, uh, you know, are you going to actually make a profit from from doing it onshore? Just given, you know, the Do high cost care? of living, higher wages, 
um, could producing, you know, higher cost of goods. Do people care though? Like, do you reckon the, the average consumer can, cares about where their product is made? Do you think someone's going to choose? I, but I, I do, but you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't think about it. They just want whatever's the best value. Uh, and in times of tough economic conditions, you probably no one gives a shit. No one gives a shit. Yeah, just yeah. just uh, buy whatever's cheapest. Whatever, yeah, whatever keeps you fed and 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 have have some spare change in your pocket, right? Um, yeah, you're probably right. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, look, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 just a fragile system. I think climate change and and weather impacts are going to have more and more of an impact on food security. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to see what industries do in terms of uh, managing managing uh, extreme weather events and uh, and supply chain. Speaking of weather change, do you agree or disagree that we did not have a summer this year? What the fuck? Yeah. Where the fuck did summer go? Ugh. Well, like I reckon we can count on one hand how many like <laughs> how plus many thirty hot days we had. Yeah, although we had the one of the hottest days on record, thirty nine, no. but. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a compressed period Crazy. of summer, hasn't it? All right. Um, an economy so good that it is so bad. And so right now, most experts are pretty bearish on, on the stock market, on the economy. And the big topic on everyone's lips right now is an economic downturn that leads to a further deterioration in company earnings. So that's what everyone's talking about, right, at, at the moment. I mean, already we've already seen company earnings deteriorate, and so whether the stock market was forecasting that or not, it appears that that's what's happened, but that's what everybody is talking about right now. Having said all of that, with all of what we've seen in the market, with all the volatility, I feel like sentiment is turning. I mean, you, you, that anecdotal example you give of the, of the developer, I was at that auction yesterday. Yeah. Mate, it was, that street was pumping. Like, it's, you know, Coburg... And I feel like the, you know, the Brunswick East people are moving further and further yeah. out. The guys had beers on their, you know, at the across the road oh, on the pillars of their house. <laughs> uh, so it was pretty chill, and yeah. mate, it was pumping. And there were probably three three really strong active bidders yep. at the auction. So I feel like sentiments turning. Whether in the property market the, the sellers' price is coming down, or maybe buyers are. Maybe there's somewhere meeting somewhere in the middle. Mm. I don't. I don't know. But I just feel like it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be. In fact, um, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, and Goldman Sachs have either, in their most recent um, forecasts, have revised up their growth expectations, or have um, been put off their uh, putting off their recession recession um, expectations. I came across this chart, and I'll bring it up now. Um, I think it's uh, the Goldman Sachs. It's the proportion of firms mentioning recession in quarterly call earnings has fallen from its peak. I think it was almost close to 45%. It's down now to 12% of companies are talking about recession. And I found that that, that was really interesting not that long ago, back end of 2022 when we had earnings season. Everyone was just talking uh, about recession. And now it just sort of appears to have um, fallen off a cliff. Uh, Do you think it's uh, re recession talk fatigue, though, that has been talked about for so long that people are just not talking about it anymore? Probably. Like, it just, it never happened. Mm. It was supposed to happen. It was, it was, it was, a recession was a shoo-in for 2022. It just never happened. And so, you know, for that reason, no one's talking about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, it's no different to when... Uh, in the in the tech wreck, after company earnings were getting clobbered, like the stock market didn't fall for like a year later, mm. and then it's got absolute. And it, the second leg down, unfortunately, was was nine eleven. That didn't help circumstances, but it was almost one full year of companies not performing as well as um, or anywhere near as well as they should have yeah. been. But the stock market was still going up. Like yeah. there was. That momentum chart that you showed before from yeah. Sentiment Trader, yeah, hundred percent. Like I, I feel like we're now in a in a situation whereby all all of all of these recession talks have, are sort of starting to evaporate, and that that cohort that is bearish is starting to get smaller and smaller. The cohort, yeah. it's not going to go away. Um, they'll remain pretty bearish, and sure, maybe we have a recession in twelve months' time, and that 
group would say, I told you so, <laughs> but it's like the stock market went up another 20% yeah. from, there, from there. So you, you, I don't think you, you, uh, you, you're never going to win. Um, so that, that's what I think we're in this position where I, I can see a lot of momentum coming through 2023. And then, yeah, maybe we get smashed um, later on in the year. I, I, I wrote a piece uh, the other day, um, the monetary lag, which shows typically going back 50, 60, 70 years yep. when interest rates are rising, what happens to the stock market and what's the dispersion? And typically, uh, when do stocks start to get hit? So it's not it's not now. It's not until like um, 18 months later or something like that that you start really feeling the, um, the impact of, of interest rate right. rises. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, we can talk a little bit more about that um, in – in a second, I think we I think we talked about this last time. This is um, the Bank of America uh, Global Fund Manager Survey. I don't know if we touched on it last week actually, but recession fears down sharply. Net percent saying recession likely in the next twelve months. Um, we we're close to eighty percent, and now we're almost at twenty two percent. I think um, uh, of those that are fearing a, a recession. So, going back to the conversation we we're having last week, if everyone's talking about it so often. I just think it can't. It's just not yeah, going to happen. Yeah. When it will happen is when it's least expected. That's when right. no one's talking about it. Um. So we've seen over the last week or two, especially since we did did um, episode thirty three, we've seen uh, strong employment data coming through, consumer spending, which has renewed the notion that I think that good news about the economy is now bad news for inflation. The the more that we try and get inflation down. Uh, and we, the more we start to see con- the, a resilient consumer, yeah. better employment numbers, and everyone's starting to shit themselves, now inflation's going to start to stick around for, for a bit longer. The bottom line for me was, was I sort of um, fast-tracked earlier on, but I think we're going through a period of sustained growth whereby, and I'm curious to hear what you think, whereby the consumer is far more resilient than what, um, what everybody thinks, that they can, in fact, absorb higher rates, as we have seen over the last few data points that we're um, that we've been receiving, and yeah, maybe it is too early to tell, but maybe inflation does keep coming down, and that we do have this Goldilocks soft landing, no landing mm. scenario. But I feel like you know, is it just possible that the economy is just doing well? Like, why is that such a big issue right now? It's a really interesting question you pose because. You know, I was just listening to a podcast this morning about Michael Burry, and he, he used the analogy of a bathtub. So when the bathtub is is full, that's when, uh, you know, uh, the economy is doing well and, and, and the velocity of money is high. And, uh, you know, obviously when the bathtub, bathtub's going low, that's when um, the governments are cranking up mon- uh, and tightening and re- um, pulling money supply out of the economy. So what he's saying was that during COVID, the bathtub was actually overflowing with money. So now that governments are tightening and pulling back the supply of money and the bathtub's actually sinking, nobody's actually considered all the water that's flown out of, out of the bathtub. And so what happens... Where did this money go? It's it's all in people's pockets. Bank waiting, accounts. And- waiting for something to happen to, okay. to deploy in the market, okay. right? And so what he's so saying is... So people's bank accounts, the... The floor rugs? The floor. <laughs> yeah, all the money tucked under Suck, the floor. Sucked in, with sucked the floor. in under okay. the floor rugs. And if you squeeze that all back into the tub, suddenly the tub's full again. And, and you're right that the impact that has is suddenly you've got um, inflation still rampant because people are, you know, they've got money to, to sort of spe- keep spending. Uh, and, and that's a really interesting one. So, yeah, you're right. I think we're, we're in for a period of, uh, you know, more sustained inflation just because people have... I need to spend. But to your point last week, like we, we we are looking at inflation numbers from really relatively low bases, and we've I feel like we've we've crossed the period whereby that peak to peak number just can't be sustained mm. the growth rate, and that's yeah. why we're seeing the numbers come down. Yeah, like where do you where do you think we land? Do you think that yeah, central banks have got a two to three percent target? But man, like what if this thing? What if central banks have to change their target for a period of time? Go, you know what? Actually, for where we are now, I think we're just we're just going to be sitting at three to four percent. Mm. Like, could could that be? Po- I, I mean, could it be possible? Yes, of course. Is it happening? No, it's not. What What do you think? 
Well, they're looking for a new uh, central bank rate setter at the moment, aren't they? Uh, so who knows? Who knows what could happen? But, you know, the, the, the party line has been that they want to get it back down to two to three. So uh, I, I'd say that they're, they're going to try and do that. Mm. Well, let's just keep waiting for those month-on-month numbers and see where we yeah where we land. That'll be interesting. And and you know, going into that now is you know we, we talked about the mortgage cliff, uh, fixed rate cliff last week. Um, in the US right now, there's a looming hunger cliff. What's with your food <laughs> sort of theme? This oh, week? I thought we'd do, we'd just go talk about food this week because uh, you know we, we talked about property last week and okay, <laughs> we're talking no, about right. food this week. So what's this about? So this is about. Uh, SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program in the US at the moment. And this feeds into, uh, I guess, how much, how much of the US population um, is, is relying on this and the impact that this has on, on, on spending in the US. So 12% of the US population are dependent on this SNAP program for their basic food supply. And... It, Congress mandated in December 2022. So is it a program that helps low-income earners? That's right. With food? Does it That's supply right. them with food? Yeah. So so they can go into a supermarket and effectively pick out what they want. And this SNAP program pays for pays for that food. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's gotcha. kind of like food stamps. Right. Yeah, the old, the old food stamps. Um, so it, it's supposed to provide assistance to low-income households during economic downturns or recessions so that fewer... Households, uh, sure. you know, uh, go hungry, um, and it's it serves as an automatic stabilizer to the economy as well, to ensure that there's some some amount of uh, uh, um, security around food. Um, so, if you think about this, the U.S. population is around 330 million, so 41 million people are enrolled for this program and will be impacted by this SNAP reduction, and. They, they're standing on to lose an average of uh, US $90 per person a month, uh, which is pretty big uh, when you look at, you know, the lowest income families in the US who are, who are on these benefits. And there's a, there was a stat here that said, you know, elderly and disabled people who live alone on fixed in- incomes who only qualify for the minimum amount of help will see their benefits plunge from $281 to $23 a month. So Which these people are massive. going for almost three hundred dollars a a month yeah, to twenty bucks to twenty bucks. Why are they reducing this program? So this was an extra benefit put in place during COVID when a lot of people lost oh, their job. Right. So it's going back to what it was before. I believe it. It's it's being yeah. I'm actually not a hundred percent sure how how much it was before COVID. Um, but yeah, to me, this seems like a pretty big drop if you're going from $281 to $23 a month. So $23, and not only is the cost of that food, to your point before, going, going up, up, so too is the cost of everything else. That's right. And then your ability to buy reduces. But I mean... Ha- so this is coming in in March 22. So the impacts haven't been felt yet in the economy, right? 23, March. T- sorry, March 23. And the, the impacts haven't been felt in the U.S. economy yet. So once this rolls through, if you think about it, you know, 41 million people, 10, 12, roughly 12% of the U.S. population are suddenly going to go, oh. 12%, right. Wait a minute. I've, I've, got, I've got to spend mo- most of my pay packet now on basic essential goods, um, and that's really going to pull back discretionary spend or, or people are going to think a lot more about um, spending in other pl- parts of the economy given their mortgages have gone up, food costs have gone up. Suddenly well, don't they just tap into the um, excess water that's spilt out of the bathtub? Like, is, <laughs> well, ma- is that what it is? Well, these are the lowest income families. You know, they're not your white collar workers who right. have, um, uh, you know, been working two jobs during COVID and saved all this money. Mm. Um, these, are, these are, you know, the lowest income um, families that are, that are going to be affected by this. Mm. And, you know, the, you see... You see a big dichotomy, I suppose, between you know the haves and the haves nots in this situation. Hasn't that always been an issue, like equality around you know the top one percent and the bottom ten percent of yeah. living? Hasn't that always, like, since Roman times, like there's always That's been right. an issue. That's why you have revolutions. Mm. So that, that it'll be really interesting to see how the impact that that has on the U.S. economy and on potential recession and the feedback loop that has in terms of consumer spending. Um, in the U.S. economy, 
um, and, and how that ripple effect flows through. But I thought that was a really interesting one. So, Have you looked at like what happened after the Spanish flu, after World War I? No. I know you talk about it all the time. Yeah. I find that like so many similarities – um, between sort of the 19 teens and the 20s and like what we're sort of going through at the moment. So I don't know, maybe that's the optimist in me that, that is trying to find something like that I can relate to yeah. and identify with what we're going now to give me some comfort that everything's going to be okay. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I think that's an important point. Like there's all these things that we don't even know about or are not even aware of yeah. that can... You know, the, the combination of these that may appear in isolation quite small uh, and sort of once you start putting them all together, it, start, it really starts to put the brakes on things. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's one of the things that pulls inflation down. I mean, it sounds pretty bad, but yeah. That's um, right. It'd be um, really interesting. I don't know. Um, so my question for you is what fixed rate cliff? I came across these two charts and... I'll, I'll share them. I'll share them in a in a moment. But what's interesting is a, the uh, the difference in how Australia's mortgages Australian mortgages work, yeah. but also how how it works in in the US. I'll bring this first chart up it's from Bank of America. Ninety um, percent of mortgages in the US at the moment are fixed. Uh, new floating mortgages as a percentage of total versus Fed hiking cycles, 1990 to January 2023. Um, you can see the Fed hiking cycles in the, in shadowed in yellow, in grey, and the floating mortgages as a percentage of total in blue. And so we're sitting at 90% or 10% that are floating, 90% that are that are fixed. And I'll show you why I think that's incredibly important, but also very deceiving to what is going on in the market right now. This second chart from Goldman Sachs, 96% of outstanding mortgages have interest rates below PMMS. I don't know what PMMS is. Uh, I probably should have looked that up. But if you have a look at the interest rates on the far left-hand axis, the vertical axis, and you've got the borrow note rates on the, um, on the horizontal axis, have a look at the... Have a look at the rates where most borrowers are sitting at. 15% of borrowers are sub 3% at the moment. And have a look, the whole, that whole chart is skewed to the left. The point that I'm trying to make is most US mortgages are locked uh, for 30 years. Mm. And so once they're locked in, it doesn't matter if rates are going up. No one's going to, and you don't need, you don't have to switch your mortgage unless you refinance, you have to switch your mortgage. Um, if you buy, sell, you have to, yeah. and that's, that's causing an issue. People have got these mortgages in the U S that they've picked up for so low during, you know, the pandemic and post pandemic that they're not moving. And so right. it's causing a, a supply issue in the U S because these people, if they sell, they can't afford the new mortgage, yes. the new 5%, yeah. 6% yeah. Uh, mortgage at the moment. So if you look that's here, fascinating. everyone's talking about the, the higher interest rates. U.S. borrowers are like, I don't give a fuck because our mortgages are here. They're, they're at yeah. sub 4%. Yeah. I mean, literally, that whole wow. distribution is to the left. Mm. And they're for 30 years. And so the thing that I've been thinking about is, um, I don't think there's anything else, anything else in that chart. The thing that I've been thinking about is, is with all these rate hikes, what's it doing? What's it doing to the everyday household, the everyday consumer? No wonder people are still spending. Yeah. They've got jobs, they've got pay rises, they've got money that flew that fell out of the bathtub or overflowed out of the bathtub. Yeah. Their mortgage is sitting at sub 3%. There you go. So really it's constricting new supply though, right? So if we if we had a chart there of uh, if, of the new supply, which is that is that the first the first chart? Now the first one just shows how much is um, fixed and variable. Yeah, so it'd be interesting uh, that, that, to that see data's whether, not here. whether the um, the amount of new loans has has really dropped off a cliff. I'm sure it, I haven't got the data now. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm sure it has. I'm sure new lending has put that on next week. Has has cool. fallen off. And that's why home builder confidence got absolutely smashed. Mm. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe people 
are now thinking, hey, actually, maybe I can borrow at 5%. Yeah. I just can't spend as much. Mm. Um, and that's what that's then what influences prices. You know, fame, uh, it's become a fa- one of my favourite quotes now. The auctioneer said yesterday, he said, come on, sir, uh, another bid for you. He said, it's only money and the bank's got plenty of it. <laughs> and I thought, you know, auction, I love auctioneers. Like yeah. they come with these quirky comments. But I thought that's, good one. that's actually quite, I mean, we, we sort of say it tongue in cheek. But it's, it's, it's actually true to the extent that the bank has plenty of it, yeah. but the bank is what controls prices. So the more money that the yeah. bank can lend someone, the more money c- someone can raise their ha- hand up at an auction. Yeah, I've always said to you, uh, I, w- I think liquidity is the key driver in these markets. And as soon as liquidity Absolutely. dries up, that's when you know the world uh, turns pear-shaped. So everyone's talking about... Um, uh, the U.S. Avo- uh, sorry, Australia avoiding a recession, and the U.S. going to go into recession. Hey, maybe the fixed rate cliff is a far greater issue for us in mm. Australia than it is for for the U.S. US. Like, I, I feel like based on this this information, these numbers, it's non-existent, it's a non-issue. Definitely looks that way. What do you reckon? Yeah, I, look, do you reckon I, that's I, why I, people are still spending. They got money and they're traveling, and yeah, hundred percent. Because the mortgages and, and haven't the, been the new generation, right? You know, Gen Gen Z, Gen Y, they're they're happy not to own their own home. They they want flexibility to be able to move around, to be able to work remotely, to travel. Yeah, but then everyone's whinging rents going up too much. Like well, they're, they're the all moving the barley. <laughs> so barley's got a, f- a new five year visa. Uh, wasn't which that, is, it was last year? Uh, wasn't last it? year, which is which is all tax free. So, you know, you're getting a lot of uh, global citizens setting up shop there, um, earning tax free income, mm. US dollars, and and living it up. Mm. Well, people still want to live in Coburg, according to yesterday's oh, there auction. You go. Um, maybe we just um, we'll head over to director's cuts. We didn't get an opportunity last week to to touch on those, but. Um, I came across a few things, actually. Um, this first headline from Bloomberg, Watchfinder cuts prices 15% as Rolex and Patek Philippe uh, values slide. And so the CEO of, of Watchfinder, quote, uh, there is pain for sure, Arjun Van de Vol, who took over as the chief executive officer of, of Watchfinder in 2021, said in an interview, you see supply going up significantly for models that we would literally have killed for just a couple of months ago. Wow, there you go. Time to buy a new watch. Well, I just think that uh, I was just thinking about it when I read this article. I thought, you know, there goes your unlisted alt, alt allocate sleeve in your in your super fun, your your artwork or your wine yeah. or your Rolexes, yeah, whiskies. Um, you know, that's the discretionary yeah. stuff that goes. Do you know what? Just NFTs. Get, NFTs, yep. Um, what were the apes? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Um, lazy apes. What are they called? <laughs> Bored apes. Bored apes. But yeah, people, people will just get rid of that thing that, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of the watch, 10 grand, that'll see me throw a ride out the next couple of months. 100%. Um, so there's a bit of that happening. I don't know how much of that is happening to actually move the dial at the moment, but just some anecdotal um, anecdotes there. The second one, uh, now, now hearing what you spoke about, really – ties in with um, the food issue. Uh, Again, Bloomberg, pricey pizza weighs on Italian wallets, even more so at home. Uh, So the, did you know this? There's a- I had no idea. There's a pizza index. Really? It's crazy. Uh, So the pizza index has just gone up berserk. It's up 25%. And that's because the price of tomato, flour, um, cheese, all of the things that you spoke about. And so all of that, the- the, the increase in price is just, it's gone up 25% in January so nuts. in one month. Insane. Um, I said that yeah, cost of mozzarella cheese, olive oil continue, can you continue to increase. I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to save money by buying uh, the portable pizza oven that I've got uh, the Gosney. Well, but looks like I'm going to be spending. I, I don't know, but what, should what, just go to Domino's. <laughs> well, that's what they're saying. They're saying the cost of buying a prepared pizza in the U S only rose 9.6% on the year making going to the store a more convenient option to preparing your own version. And so I wonder if that's like influencing retail sales and food and and, mm. and, and drink with people, you know, going and spending money because the pizza index is up 20, 25%. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Um, do you have anything here? I, I had a, I had a funny, crazy world record that I, I, I was, I was looking up this week. Um, so swimming under ice sticks Severison um, from Greenland 
So in terms of insanity level, it's uh, a level 10 out of 10. 10 all right. Um, but he, he swam 80 metres under under ice, which is the record. Man, I'm just getting claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> Longest swim under ice with one breath, uh, which uh, is fascinating because I, I actually I was interested in this because I wanted to start freediving this year. Um, What's freediving? So freediving is, it can be a competitive sport where you basically try and hold your breath for the longest period of time and dive for as deep as you can. Um, Off a diving board? No, no. So you're, you're in the water. They put a rope down. It can go down a couple hundred meters. And as a free diver, you do a breath hold. And you do you have any oxygen? No, nothing. You Based on one breath. Um, and some of these guys can go six, seven, eight minutes. Maybe some longer. I don't understand. Where's the rope? The rope just guides you so that oh, when the, you're down the, 200 me- oh, like there's a rope meters... In the water. In the water. Right. That goes down a deep. Where are you? Are you in the ocean? the ocean? Yeah. How do you get there? A boat? A boat, yeah. And then you got to dive or, off or, the boat. Or it's near shore. Yeah, or you dive off. Well, you Everyone's can't be near there. shore if you're going to go 200 metres down in the water. Well, sometimes there's a drop off, <laughs> okay. right? Um, but yeah, you're, you're on a boat. There's a usually, you know, there, you can look it up. There's some comp- there's competitions. That Do you have like, a, what are they called? Paddles? Like the thing? Yes. Oh, you got flippers? Flippers? Yeah. So they have special flippers that are, you know, longer, more aerodynamic, oh, yeah. carbon. Goggles? So you can see uh, Yeah, goggles. What's going on. And, you know, there's a different way of equalising your breath. But... You effectively, yeah, you hold your breath, see how deep you can go. But I don't want to do that stuff. I want to do the more uh, shallower, you know, you know, fifteen meter sort yeah, of stuff. Look at the kids' pool at Box Hill, <laughs> <Ackling. laughs> Well, just being able to basically go in and, and see see wildlife without having all the gear. Right. Yeah. So it's almost meditative. Right. When you're down there, you know, it's quiet. Um, you know, you don't disturb the wildlife, and yeah, you, you can you can do do a bit of a free dive. Far free out. diving, look it up. That's what it's called. But yeah, I thought this is pretty insane. I just like my breath. I'm, I'm, my chest is just like <laughs> collapsing at the moment. Um, all right. Well, uh, what do you got for tips and recommendations uh, tips today? Tips and recs. I read a great book a couple of weeks ago, Red Roulette by Desmond Shum. So this was a really interesting one. It's a fascinating autobiography into the inner workings of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Mm. Uh, and who's how, Desmond? Is he, the, is he the author? Or was so he's he? the author. Yes, and he was an entrepreneur in China who uh, they made billions of dollars delivering out, um, you know, a industrial warehouse park for Beijing Airport, um, one of the biggest developments in Beijing, um, and and a number of other big big projects and big investments in um, Ping An Insurance, for example, uh, when they listed on on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, so it was. That was, it was fascinating just to see the inner workings of how um, as China was growing and, and needed entrepreneurs to, to stimulate the economy, the, the ruling party and the people that were leading the party um, created these sort of mutually beneficial relationships when it suited them uh, to uh, make billions of dollars and amass billions of dollars of wealth and almost like uh, PPP, like a you know, public-private partnership. Um, but you know this this fell out of favor when Xi Jinping came into power and mm. he consolidated, tried to fight corruption, and um, this guy's wife is actually still MIA, so she's been held indefinitely by China's uh, security agency. Where's he? Is he in China? He's he's he's, uh, he's in London. Yeah, he's so out. He's long out. Gone. Yeah, long gone. And his so, wife's just disappeared. Yep, disappeared, and she. The only reason he found out she was alive was she called him to tell him not to release his book. Wow! Yeah, really. Yeah, fascinating. And he said, "On my conscience, um, you know, I, I have to do this. I have to release this book." So it's uh, pretty. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Wow! Highly recommend you How has he not been like hunted down? Well, he said, "Look, if if they wanted to get me, they will. It doesn't ma- I can't hide from it. Um, but it's it's something that's been weighing on my conscience, and I, I need I need to do this." Um, so, you know, he said so if, if he gets assassinated, like, he, he gets assassinated. Yeah. It is what it is. Remember Jack Ma went missing? Yeah. Um, he was playing golf? Yep. And now you, you, there's no articles. He hasn't said anything to the media. He's been as quiet. He, he was in Melbourne, I think, last week. Oh, really? Yeah. But he's been as quiet as uh, quiet can be. You haven't heard a peep out of him since he got... He, since, he got uh, since he came back from his golf trip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's right. Good, good weekend. <laughs> yeah, it must have been a real good weekend. Um, yeah, that's interesting, actually. Mm. Um, yeah, wonder what happened to his wife. Um, so, 
on that sort of Chinese theme, I've got a recommendation, which I'm hoping you didn't take and you didn't, so I'm glad. Uh, we went to Red Spice Road last week on Queen Street in the city. I haven't been there, well, actually, I have been there a couple of times before you and I went, yeah. but I hadn't been there in such a long time. So if anyone hasn't been to Red Spice Road, it is uh, very, it's very open, spacious, uh, probably a modern Chinese restaurant and it's the food is all it's all sharing isn't it yeah mostly sharing all sharing you know big big long tables it's really noisy in there though, mm. don't you reckon like yeah. i remember when we came out like our ears were ringing yeah. uh but the food is excellent the price is i think it is so well priced yes yeah, great value for money yeah excellent value for money and you can have business lunches there but the food is bloody good and if you're vegetarian or vegan they cater for vegetarian and vegan Really, really, really well. So if you haven't been to Red Spice Road, check it out. Um, I don't know what number Queen Street, but it's uh, on on yeah on yeah, Queen Street. Moved. Yes, I'm not uh, sure on the you know. almost on the corner of Burke and Queen. Yeah, that's right. Um, so check out Red Spice Road um, and the still s- doing the sticky pork belly, which is amazing. Is it for those non vegans I wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, and the service is really good. I don't know how, what you found it, but yeah, I found the yeah. service yeah top notch. Really, really good. Um, we'll wrap it up. We've got a, a special guest for next week, someone who's going to join us. So join us for next week as well. We're going to do a deep dive into a specific asset class and we'll, we'll, we'll get to know a little bit more about the ins and outs. Um, we'll talk a lot about property uh, coming off on that. So join us next week. Um, hit us up on YouTube and Spotify and we'll uh, catch you next week. My name is Robert Baharian. And I'm the founder and CEO of Baharian Wealth Management, AFSL 526-798. The information contained in this podcast by me and or our guests may include general advice and does not consider your personal circumstances. You should seek personal advice from a registered financial advisor who can consider whether the general advice is right for you.